Bon après-midi, mesdames et messieurs. Buenas tardes, damas y caballeros. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sung Hoon Kim, and I'll be your MC for this event. I would like to welcome all of you to the International Civil Aviation Organization's 40th Assembly Sky Talks. Over a course of a two-week period, we have 68 presentation for you coming from uh, aviation industry leaders and experts. And I would like to uh, make sure that you come into our uh, IKEA website on uh, YouTube to check out more uh, information. Today is uh, day five, session number 10, and we continue with our topic of big data. More specifically, we're going to tell you about the procurement process for states. To give you the presentation from Quebec Consulting, please welcome Mr. Mark Reeves, Executive Director, and Mr. Christopher R. Schmidt, Senior Director. Thank you very much, Mr. Kim. Uh, first of all, it's, it's wonderful to be here back in Montreal uh, at the IKO, and I want to send my congratulations out to all of the delegates at the 40th Triennial Assembly of the International Civil Aviation Organization. We're, we're excited to be here and to be participating here uh, with you all. By way of introduction of myself, I want to, I want to share with you, and for the, for the purpose of context, my past seven years, the last seven years of my career with the FAA, I spent in the international aviation community. The last year and a half as an Air Navigation Commissioner here in Montreal, nominated by the United States. The five and a half years prior to that, I was spent in Asia. I was based in Singapore. And I had a unique opportunity to see and get a sense of, of what was happening in the aviation uh, community globally. And there was two recurring themes that, that stood out to me. First of all, traffic was trending upwards everywhere. Aviation is growing. It's, a, it's an undeniable fact. The second uh, recurring theme was that states wanted and needed to increase their capacity. So what, I, what that usually uh, looked like was uh, authorities from these different states would attend international meetings here in Montreal, innovation fairs, world aviation forums, and an assorted other international uh, fora. They'd see amazing tools designed to correct specific problems. And then they would get excited. The excitement would grow, sales pitches would fly, and investment, investment decisions were put in motion. What I saw in far too many cases, and I think many people in the international aviation community see, is that states would end up purchasing a solution, and then they would start to work to find a problem for it to solve. States would spend millions of dollars on equipment systems, that were either underutilized because they didn't fit the problem or they were never implemented because the purchase agreement was incomplete. The question that those of us in the international community asked over and over was how to fix it. And the answer that kept coming back was do a good business case. So we all could agree on what needed to be done, but the problem that was not so clear, the solution that was not so clear was how do we do it? So I asked the experts at Quebec Consulting if they could break down simply how a state would go about building a business case. And then I asked them if they'd be willing to share that with the global aviation community. The good news is that they agreed. And with that, I'd like to introduce to you Christopher Schmidt, the Senior Director of Quebec Consulting. Quebec Consulting is a company that brings over a decade of business, of building, of experience building business cases and doing investment analysis in over 160 projects with a value of in excess of $10 billion. So they're very well positioned to speak to this, and they've agreed to give us some tools that we can share with the interna international community that hopefully will improve your opportunities for success when, with procurements. So with that, Mr. Schmidt. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. So I want to start off by providing a little bit of context. You can't really talk about a business case without understanding the information that goes into the business case, the purpose of the business case, and the outcome of the business case. So keeping that in mind, the purpose of this presentation is to provide a simple overview of the procurement process that we would generally undertake. It is a standardized and repeatable procurement process that has been proven across the industry. <clears throat> But what we've attempted to do is simplify it into four major questions that you should ask yourself throughout the life cycle of your procurement process. The first question is, what is the problem? The second question, 
what is the solution? The third question, how do I acquire this solution? And fourth, how do I implement and manage the solution as it's being deployed? So let's talk about this first problem. Let's, let's unpack it. What is the problem? What's the problem? All right, so hopefully you've been engaging your stakeholders throughout, you know, your NAS, right? Who are your stakeholders? You've got your air traffic controllers. You've got your technical operators. You've got your systems engineers. You've got your budgeting authority. You've got your decision authority. These are the people who are invested in the continued operations and sustainment and evolution of the technology in your airspace. You want to engage these people to discuss the risk, issues, and opportunities that are prevalent in your NAS, in your airspace, your national airspace. Now, what is a risk, what is an issue, and what is an opportunity? A risk is something on the horizon, something you see in the distance that is a concern, a problem, right? I may have a radio tower that is uh, the only radio tower in a specific sector that is communicating with airplanes. Right? So natural disaster strikes, a hurricane comes running through, or a landslide happens and knocks the radio tower out. All of a sudden, I've lost the ability to communicate with airplanes. I now have to reroute air traffic around this sector in order to keep planes in the air, keep tra traffic moving, right? <clears throat> this is a risk. It is a problem that is not inherent today that needs to be addressed to prevent a problem from happening in the future. So what is an issue? An issue is a problem today. It is a risk, in many cases, that has been unmanaged and is now a major concern to your stakeholders. So an issue might be, you know, I have 500 kilome uh, square kilometers of airspace that has no surveillance. It's a mountainous region. It's very hard to get to. I cannot see targets in this entire region. This is an issue. An opportunity is more like a uh, a nice to have, a want. We have the opportunity to increase the sector capacity by implementing this solution. I like to make a joke here. An opportunity is like a need versus a want. My family needs a car. My daughter wants a pony. I don't need the pony, but I need the car. So what am I going to invest in? All right, so that's a silly joke. So with your stakeholders, you're going to discuss the risk, the issues, and the opportunities, and you're going to understand, articulate, and document these needs into a strategic plan. Now, this is incredibly important because what this does is in a transparent fashion, you're able to articulate the national priorities of your state. You can balance the wants and needs amongst all of your stakeholders and address them and agree to them together. Sometimes your air traffic controllers want a solution that your operators don't want or need. This provides a forum for you to discuss it, agree to it, and prioritize your problems and your needs. So that is how you understand the problem. The next step would be, what is the solution? What is the solution to this problem that we've just identified? Your first step here is to def define, the <coughs> excuse me, define the preliminary requirements. So what does that look like? Well, let's stick with the opportunity. Excuse me. Let's stick with the issue. We have 500 square kilometers of unsurveilled airspace, right? So I need a surveillance system that provides coverage for 500 square feet. It must be, uh, it must be able to operate. It must be installed in a mountainous region and work in a mountainous region. It must be able to track targets between a minimum altitude and a maximum altitude. It must be interoperable with the other equipment the other equipment that I've deployed to my airspace. Now, these are just four general high-level preliminary requirements. A surveillance system is going to be incredibly complex, so I would encourage you to go to, like, maybe 100 <laughs> preliminary requirements. But the point here is to understand the solution that you're trying to implement. Once you have your preliminary requirements document, you can explore alternatives, paths to satisfy functional and performance requirements. And you do this by engaging the market, engaging the industry, release market surveys, go to conferences, talk to vendors, see what technology is out there in the world today. Maybe you talk to your fellow countries, you know, hey, country B, you seem to have a very similar region of airspace that is also mountainous. What is your surveillance solution? What did you deploy here? That, 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 what are your lessons learned? Did you have problems with it? What this is going to get you to do is validate the maturity of technology and validate your requirements. 
So what does that mean? Well, that means, are my, are, are my requirements too complex? Am I requesting too much out of the commercial environment? Does nothing exist that's going to satisfy my needs based on these requirements? Or you might find the opposite, or you were not thorough enough with your requirements, and all of a sudden you're overwhelmed with all of the technical solutions that are placed before you. So you go back to your requirements, amend your requirements, and move on. In parallel, you are planning for investment analysis. So what does that mean? Right? You're going to call your bank. You're going to address your budgeting authority. You're going to go to your legislator. You're going to understand your budget. Maybe you have $100 million dollars in one year, but you can only have a spend plan that has five million thereafter. So you have to understand what you're dealing with. You may want to spec out the Lamborghini, but you can only afford a Toyota. If you do not recognize these problems early in the life cycle, before engaging vendors in an official ledger, excuse me, in an official uh, proposal, you will have massive problems later on. That goes to our next question. How do I acquire this solution? Now this is my favorite part because this is the meat of the work. The first step is to form an investment analysis team. If, I, if you take anything away from this presentation, it is this. That is, you have to maintain the independence of your investment analysis team. Now, I'm going to say that again. You have to maintain the independence of your investment analysis team. Now, what does that mean, right? So very often, these states, both sophisticated and not, will take vendor-provided information and incorporate it into their investment analysis. They'll take the vendors at their word. The vendors don't know the problems that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. They're not going to know how long they need to train, the lead time they need to train your air traffic controllers. They don't know the communications infrastructure that you have to relay data between the surveillance equipment and your towers or your tracons. And they will also, they have teams dedicated to selling you their stuff. So if all of a sudden your investment analysis is just a sales pitch from a vendor, you can't guarantee that the information that you're provided is accurate. Thirdly, and probably most importantly, the independence of your investment analysis team allows you to complete a life cycle cost estimate that you can use to hold the vendor accountable throughout the duration of the execution of the program. We'll come back to that later. So what does the investment analysis team do? They're going to develop a life cycle cost estimate and a benefits quantification for each alternative solution. So let's say you're looking at the differences between a ground-based ADSB system and a space-based ADSB system. We've got two alternatives, right? You want the system that you deploy to exist for 25 years, be operational in your airspace for 25 years, right? So you want to understand what are the total life cycle costs. In the United States, we call this a cradle-to-grave estimate from birth and concept definition through execution and delivery into maintenance and ultimately disposal to make sure you capture the entire picture of what you're working with. Now, I'm a cost estimator, cost analyst by trade, so I could sit here and talk about what goes into a life cycle cost estimate for hours. But the point I want you to take away from here is that you have to think of the costs beyond the hardware and software requirement. If I want this system to be operational for 25 years, I need to understand that I may be deploying a router that goes end of life every eight years. So I need to have supply support and a, and a depot set up so I can store these spare parts and ship them out to my new sites. As they come online, they're going to be operational for eight years. I'm going to see the routers fail, and I can ship out a new router to fix it instead of having to deploy a brand new system. On top of that, you need to understand the other costs not associated with the prime vendor. What are your training costs? What are the shipping costs? What are the ancillary costs that surround the investments? If you're deploying radios, you need to also take in the cost of the batteries that are going to operate these radios, the cables that are going to run the information. Does the spec, do I need to install new telecommunication lines to, to, to be able to have the throughput of data go to my tower so my controllers have the information that they need to make decisions? All of these questions 
go into the development of the life cycle cost estimate, and it's important to note that this is a tool. This is a living document that gets updated throughout the duration of the life cycle cost estimate. Remember that. <clears throat> so the second major product that the investment analysis team is supposed to develop is the benefits quantification for each alternative solution. This is your opportunity to talk about why you're buying this product. Is it going to increase traffic counts? Am I going to be able to have more efficient routes? If I put the surveillance system in this mountainous region, maybe now I can have air traffic go over the mountain into a busy city instead of around the mountain and reducing a three-hour flight time to a one-hour flight time. The fuel savings, the environmental impact, the cost savings to private industry, the increased passenger count, maybe people will be more interested in coming to the city because it's easier to get there. All of these opportunities can be quantified and monetized, and you have to do it for each alternative. I'll tell you why. Because the life cycle cost estimate and the benefits quantification feed the business case. You know, and that's why we're all here. The business case purpose is to tell the story to everybody, your stakeholders, your decision authority, your budgetary authority, why you are investing in this technology. So in a atypical business case, you're going to document the as-is state of your airspace. We currently have these problems, and we have these radars, and we have these solutions, and you're going to document the to-be state of both alternatives. The to-be state is going to talk through the costs that you've discovered in your LCCE, the technical requirements that you wish to deploy, and the benefits of doing each one. Now, usually at the end, you're going to assess your net present value and return on investment and understand the payback period of these quantified benefits, but we don't have to talk about that right now. The point is, is that business case goes to the decision authority for them or the person to select an optimal alternative. From there, you prepare and release a tender in order to solicit and evaluate offers from the industry. Now, what is exciting about that is no longer are you going out to industry and saying, <clears throat> I need a radar to deploy in this region. You're going to say, I need a ground-based ADSB system installed at these eight locations with a telecommunication infrastructure that looks like this and a software maintenance package that looks like that so I know how often I'm going to need updates and a logistics profile that looks like this that I can sustain for 25 years. Oh, and by the way, I need it deployed in the next five years. Now you have a definitized requirement, a robust tender that you can push out to industry. And you know what? Vendors love this because it makes the whole process easier for everybody. They now know what to bid. They now know the level of detail that they need to be providing support. And now you know what you're getting into with them. And you can have educated, informed, data-informed, data-invested <laughs> decisions and discussions with the vendor. So once you receive all the proposals back, you're going to evaluate each of them for the cost, schedule, and technical reasonableness to make sure you're getting what you want in a timely manner and it's going to stay within budget. And then you're going to enter into formal negotiations with the selected vendor. Now I can talk about negotiations for an hour too, but the point here again is because you've done all this upfront work, analyzing requirement, knowing your cost, you can have educated discussions with the vendor. Why did you select these kind of cables? Why did you select that processor? I don't think we need to spend this kind of money on this video card. I think we can spend it on this one because it's a lot cheaper and it's the same technical alternative. Now the vendors take that information back and they process it. They either agree or disagree, but you know, you can have the discussion. You're no longer haggling, you're negotiating. The second thing here is because, you know, we already talked about the trade-offs between cost and schedule and technical. You can have that discussion with the vendor. Say the vendor says, I want 10 people to deploy this system to this location. And you say, no, I really only need five. The vendor will take that information back, deliberate, and decide, you know what, we probably can do this with five people, but it's going to take three months longer to turn a site online. And you know what, you may take that to your decision authority and say, that's great, we're okay, we would rather stay under cost than meet this scheduled delivery. And that's a trade-off you can assess and reasonably address. 
Lastly, and I'm running out of time, is implementation. How to implement and manage the solution. So after you've agreed to a tender, there's a whole bunch of other information that you need to process. What is your acceptance criteria? Do you want independent software validating test teams to making sure that the, what the vendor is developing and deploying is consistent with your spec? The thing that I want to talk about here is the first bullet on this slide. Develop and agree to a formal financial and program management plan to hold the vendor accountable to track the cost, schedule, and technical performance. So what does that mean? That means regular intervals of checking in with the vendor to see, are we executing this program according to plan? And if you're not, what is corrective action that can, be occur what, that can take place in order to modify the deployment? Or even better, um, what are issues and, things and opportunities for us to, to address these problems? Now, the, in my opinion, the biggest important factor of this financial check-in, this program management plan, is to have an early warning system for when the program goes off track. You want to know way ahead of time if this cost is going to, if the cost of this program is going to blow up 100, 200, 300 percent. Let's say you find early on that the cost of your equipment is not what you expected. Let's say you missed the requirement. Let's say the vendor missed the requirement, and all of a sudden there's a massive cost overrun. If you can catch that early enough in the program, you can update that living document that you created, the LCC, the life cycle cost estimate, to reflect an updated estimate at complete. You know, hey, we originally set down this path, it was only going to be $100 million. Now we're projecting the cost of $300 million. You go to your decision authority because your cost estimate, your independent, um, your independent investment analysis team has maintained their independence and can report this information objectively to your decision authority. The decision authority can process that and say, you know what, no, the risk is too high. We need to continue with execution. I will reallocate funds. Here's more money. Or the decision authority will say, no, I'd like to cancel the program and go back to the initial beginning phases of this acquisition, reassess alternatives, re-engage industry, and start over again. Yeah. So, with that being said, that is <clears throat> the end of my presentation. But one thing I'd like to end with is that in support of the No Country Left Behind initiative, we're going to release this proposal, excuse me, this presentation through the GAMP portal, along with industry-adopted best practices for business case development, life cycle cost estimating development, and our procurement process templates. Thank you for your time. I'd like to invite, invite <coughs> Mark back up on stage and open the floor for any questions people may have. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you very much. All right. Mr. Kim, are there, are there any questions from the group? Thanks, Chris, for the presentation. Wonderful to see that uh, approach. Uh, as you may know, the assembly this week is almost done, and we are ready to endorse the sixth edition of the Global Navigation Plan. We already have recommendations for several different operational improvements to uh, evolve the navigation system on a global base. Could you elaborate a little bit on how important for an air navigation service provider or a state or an international organization, how important it is for them to perform a cost-benefit analysis or a business case before deciding on an operational improvement to be deployed or a technology to be installed? Well, thank you, thank you for your question, Salvo. As a cost estimator, I'm going to tell you it's the most important thing a state can do. It is the only tool, a cost-benefit analysis, that is going to analyze um, a requirement um, with complete fidelity. Right? Ultimately, we want to know what is the price of the system, what is the price impact. That's what we have uh, um, taxpayers that we need to report to. We, need, we have uh, generated income. We're being trusted with this funding, and we're putting it onto a program. We want to guarantee that this money is going to bring back an investment into our state. I mean, that's why we're investing in aviation, right? 
I don't think there's any other tool that's going to exist that's going to tell you the big picture, the entire thoroughness of what you're signing up for. I mean, only you can address your environment. Only you know your culture, your geography. Only you know the problems that are going to exist when you start deploying this program. The vendors aren't going to be able to tell you. Only you know what systems you have deployed today. So in order to assess interoperability, if you want one system to talk to another system, only you can assess that. In the life cycle cost estimate, the benefits case, are two, to well, two tools, I guess, since we're going to talk about the benefits quantification in the business case, that are going to document all of that in a transparent fashion. And like I said before, it's a, it's a, it's a, a living document. It's a living tool. So as new information comes out, you're going to update it, document the changes. So as the program evolves, and you look back in time, and you say, how did we get here? Well, everybody will know. So transparency, accountability, Nothing else will provide that in the acquisition process. Did I miss anything? No, I think the only, the only thing I might add to that, Saulo, and, and it may be obvious, but it's, it's a public trust. Directors general, uh, uh, elected officials are all, are all held to a certain level of public trust. And, and in your personal life, you wouldn't make any investment decision without doing the homework. I, I think the, the, and the metaphor that was put forward was purchasing a car. Uh, and, and the difference between a Lamborghini and a, and a truck. Well, I, I work on a farm part of the time in the summer, and a Lamborghini won't do me a lot of good when I, when I really need to move branches and, and leaves. The, if you do the homework, you'll make sure that your, the dollars you spend, are you're getting the maximum value and, and you're getting the maximum utility out of your plan. So, so I think it's, it's just responsible um, leadership and management to do the homework. So. Thank, thanks, Chris, and thanks, Mark, for that. And apologies in advance. I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> Sal, Chief of the Global Interoperable Systems section here in the KO headquarters. But just as a follow up to my previous question, is to perform a cost benefit analysis or a business case requires some specific skills that's not available easily in, in the whole world today. You know, we have specific skills necessary that's not just available off the shelf. What would be your recommendation to a state or an NIV service provider that needs to perform this analysis, but they do not have the skills? What would be your recommendation, which is the approach that they should take? Well, Thank you. if I may, is what you, what you just described is, I think, the problem that I was trying to speak to at the very beginning. There's, this is not as simple as, as our chart may have made it sound. And, and what, what we are trying to do is, is provide as much information as we can, make it as accessible as we can through uploading these documents, these templates, and these worksheets. Clearly, uh, I, I mean, this isn't supposed to be commercial, but obviously there's a lot of experience at COBEC that could be, could be leveraged. And, and other contractors exist, I'm sure, that could give you financial uh, support. So it, the support doesn't have to be in-house. That's the beauty of it. You don't have to hire an entirely new staff. I think the example uh, came up as, what if I'm only purchasing a radar system once every five years? Would I build an entire staff to do this one job every five years? Of course not. Just like any, any specialized experience, you can look to private industry to find help with that. Sometimes it can either be to do all the work, and it might be someone to manage the process for you with your own staff that could teach them. So I, I would, the, the, the nice answer would be, oh, you could just call IKO and they would be able to do the work for you. But we, we both know that's not the role of, of IKO. Um, but because it is such an important component of any kind of investment decision, uh, we were, we're hoping to get at least a little bit of help to the international community through the, through the tools we're uploading. Anything you want to add to that? Thank you for the question. All right. Okay, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Kim, and thank you uh, to the International Civil Aviation Organization and Skytox for the opportunity to be here today.